Hi, my name's Doug Smith. I work in Yellowstone National Park. I was hired 25 years ago to reintroduce wolves and restore them to Yellowstone. I've spent most of my life actually with wolves. And the title of my talk, Wolves in a Modern Age, doesn't mention Yellowstone, but wolves are bigger than just the park. They have been kind of a cultural issue for thousands of years. And eradication of them has occurred the several hundred years. And so bringing them back to Yellowstone in a modern age has been kind of a deadly mix because Yellowstone is very high profile and so are wolves. So what I wanna do is kind of tell that story of wolves and interwoven in it is talk about what happened in Yellowstone and why that's significant past Yellowstone. And so this is my second WCN Expo. I appreciate the opportunity to come both of those times. And the way I began my talk last time was to talk about one of our greatest presidents, certainly the greatest conservation president. But what was very important is he, Theodore Roosevelt, referred to wolves as the beasts of waste and desolation. And I actually met with his great grandson in my office in Yellowstone, and I asked him pointedly, would uh, TR still refer to wolves that way? And because of his great conservation ethic, he did not think so. But nonetheless, Teddy Roosevelt reflected the cultural norms of that time, the human attitudes towards wolves, which was to get rid of them. So the goal of my talk today and Yellowstone Wolf Recovery is to help uncover the truth about wolves through scientific discovery. And science really is our best way forward. And the best way to tell about science is through stories. So here are some of these Yellowstone Wolf stories which reflect over a broader area than just Yellowstone, really worldwide, because that's the scope of what Yellowstone brings in. And so Yellowstone, wolves are symbolic. They mean many things to many people. Some don't like them. Others view them as the quintessential wilderness animal. The howl of the wolf is a defining feature of this connection to wild nature. And Yellowstone was established in 1872 as the world's first national park. And the policy then was predator control. Kill wolves, kill cougars, kill coyotes, bobcats, lynx, wolverine. Bears are preserved. But how could you have a national park without top level carnivores, top level North American carnivores? And so this eradication campaign began in the mid 1800s and the last wolf was killed in Yellowstone 1926, gone from the West by the 1930s, before really anybody knew what they did. And this was Yellowstone as well. This is the far North. Yes, remote areas of Northern Canada were not immune. This is the Northwest Territory, uh, North, North, Northwest Territories in 1960. Remote areas, they flew planes in, landed them on frozen lakes uh, using uh, skis, spread out poison baits that attracted the wolves. The wolves ate them, died and froze, and they stacked them here in the snow like cordwood. So the view of wolves for thousands of years was they are competitors, they're the antithesis of civilization, manifest destiny gives us the right to wipe them out. This is the backdrop of Yellowstone wolf recovery. And so here is where wolves lived before this influence, primarily of European humans took effect. Now you'll see the Eastern half of North America doesn't have the gray wolf. There was a different species there, the red wolf, but pretty much the entire North American continent was inhabited by wolves. Uh, the gray wolf depicted here when European humans settled the continent. And then after a couple centuries, this is the distribution of wolves. 
much reduced. And the only place they occurred really in the lower 48 was northern Minnesota. That remnant population that you see in Wisconsin and Upper Peninsula, Michigan, was lost in the 1960s. The, the rectangle is Yellowstone. So you can see this great reduction in wolf range due to this perceived conflict that we had with them. Or we wanted the land, not them. So I have to pause for a moment to take a break. Why this wolf hatred? Why do we not like them? And take a close look at this slide. This is what wolves do. They kill. And we've got to confront that head on and directly because this is the big criticism I hear it personally all the time. What you're seeing on the slide, many people describe as awful. But this is all of nature. This is the natural world. This is what wolves do. This is what we do. This is what many creatures do. Why it's that way, I don't know, but it is that way. And so this is why we eradicate wolves, because they kill. They kill wild game that we hunt. They occasionally kill livestock. Um, some say they're a human safety threat. This is much overblown. But look at this closely and think. This is nature. We need to accept it as it is. So this is nature in Yellowstone. Was nature really, truly wild? The goal of the US National Park Service is to restore and preserve natural ecosystems. Could you take out all the wolves and cougars and coyotes and other carnivores and say that it is a natural system? Once the carnivores were removed, then the check on the elk population was gone. And the Park Service and the state of Montana had to take over control of these elk because their population grew in number. And growing in number, they had impacts on the vegetation. These are elk browsing willow. They also browsed aspen. They also browsed cottonwood. And they suppressed it below their normal level. Now, grazing is a separate issue. Uh, the grazing that the elk did probably stimulated productivity. But that was probably unnatural as well. So it was an out of kilter system due to loss of these large carnivores. So when we begin thinking of how to restore wolves and we begin thinking about the policy needed, the key piece was 1973 Endangered Species Act. Wolves are listed in 1974. This is a shift in human thinking from everybody not liking wolves to only half. And this is reflected in the Endangered Species Act and immediately came to mind one of the most intact temperate zone ecosystems on the planet, the Great Yellowstone Ecosystem, anchored in the middle by Yellowstone National Park, 2.2 million acres. Around it is Forest Service primarily, but also uh, wildlife refuges, another 16 million acres. So 18 million total, about the size of Connecticut. This came to mind, obviously, as a place to restore wolves because its wildness was still intact. Again, the conflict between wolves and humans is so great, they can't be restored anywhere. So how did this happen? We didn't restore more wolf habitat. In fact, human incursions on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are increasing. Population, human population is increasing. And this is contrary to wolf recovery. So how did this happen? We didn't grow more wolf habitat. Cultural norms changed. Human attitudes changed. The heart, our heart. How does that happen? Actually, I don't know. It's maybe more up to you guys talking about this with friends, reflecting on is there room in the environment, in nature, for more than just people? That's a cultural norm shift. That's not anything I can do or science can do. That's something that you're gonna to have to do. And so here's the first wolf. In 1995, we went to Alberta, Canada. In 1996, we went to British Columbia, Canada. 1997, we went to Northwest Montana, got 41 wolves, brought them in over those years. And this is the, one of the first shipments of wolves. This is a, a young female wolf. She was a pup at the time, named number seven in her shipping container on the, this is actually in Yellowstone. She went on to found the first pack. We call it the Leopold pack and her offspring contributed to the recovery of wolves after this photo was taken, a key wolf. And wolves are a big deal. 
Yellowstone's a famous park. You combine those two things and you get the Secretary of the Interior showing up. That's Bruce Babbitt in the blue, and that's Molly Beatty uh, in the brown, who was the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service at the time. Unfortunately, she passed away a couple years after this photo was taken, and we named this pack that she's carrying in after her, and we named it Molly's Pack, and they're still in existence. This is the longest running wolf pack in Yellowstone, 25 years. Average age of a wolf pack is about half that. So a remarkable pack, who knows? Maybe they're being carried on by Molly Beatty's spirit. Spirit was a big part of this though, because these are Aboriginal people. This is the day the wolves came back. These Native Americans came back to spiritually and culturally welcome the wolves back. So this is more about ethics and ecology and biology. It's about human traditions. And those two folks there on the right have actually come back to Yellowstone every March for 25 years to pray for the wolves' continued uh, well-being. And so this is very important culturally as well uh, as biologically. And oddly, in this day and age of polarization, the process, as I mentioned, Endangered Species Act 1973, wolves listed 74. Uh, we didn't do the reintroduction until 95, so it took 20 years of bipartisan work. When do you see bipartisanship recently? Republicans and Democrats through the different administrations uh, pulled together to get this done. So this is a very important example for now, moving forward with other conservation. And in fact, the sitting president, President Clinton, depicted here in the middle, was vacationing in Jackson, Wyoming, flew up in his helicopter, walked to the pen and helped us feed the wolves. You can see the Secret Service guy in the background uh, talking to them. They were not excited to have the leader of the free world in a pen swarming with wolves. Uh, we guaranteed them it would be fine. So there he is with Chelsea feeding a uh, firsthand look at wolves. So this was a big deal. This had conservation import, not just in America, but across the world. So how have they been doing? Here's a look at the first 25 years. The population followed my pointer, took off rapidly. The uh, dark blue is the northern part of the park, which is only 10% of the park's area. Light blue is the park interior, but most of the elk are in the north. This gray bar is the total population for the park. We hit a peak around 174 and 16 packs. We had a couple disease outbreaks, but they bounced right back. Disease outbreak here, bounce back. Disease outbreak here, they didn't bounce back. We feel this is an equilibrium with their food source, and the population's been stable roughly the last 12 years. So the big ecological question is, how long is this gonna last? We're calling this second part phase two, this part phase one. What will phase three look like? And so one thing that we've tried to do because of this high profile Yellowstone uh, project, garnering the attention of the world, but we've really tried to document everything that's going on. And this is us capturing and handling wolves. We've caught over uh, 450 different individuals. We've radio collared them, we've pulled blood, to look at genetics and disease. And this has made us one of the most recognized wolf programs in the world because of the amount of information we're able to get. We also have to fly. Virtually all wolf studies have to fly small aircraft. Here I am with a pilot that I flew with for over 20 years. We have several thousand hours flying together, but wolves move so much over hundreds of square miles. They're secretive, they live in remote areas, you need a plane. But what's made Yellowstone special is we can combine this handling of individuals with the aerial monitoring with also, and this is unique to Yellowstone, seeing them from the ground. Charlie Knowles came to Yellowstone in July. We took him out. He could see the wolves. Day in, day out, you combine that with handling them, flying over them, and the amount of information you get is remarkable. And so this is the landscape, how they've occupied it. Um, blank areas in the map because there's not year-round prey there. In the winter, they leave. 
The circle territories are wolves that we do not have radio collars in, but you can see most of the wolves live in the north because the winter weather is less severe. You can see the Lamar Canyon pack there. I'm gonna talk about them right now. These are the two wolves that started the Lamar Canyon pack. On the right, the gray wolf is the male, uh, 925. On the left, you can see the smaller stature, 926. Uh, they left their territory because their territory has few elk in it in the winter. They crossed into another wolf pack's territory, found a dead elk that they had killed, and they started scavenging it. The resident pack found them and killed the gray wolf, 925. So 926 retreated back to her territory. And a week later, the males that did the killing showed up and she accepted them, paired with them. Now her offspring left, her pups from the year before left. Dad got killed, we're not gonna take these new males in, but she was pregnant by 925 and they helped raise her pups later than they were born. This generated a ton of discussion. Why would a creature do that, except the killers of her mate? Again, we have to accept nature for what it is. And wolves live short lives. You may not have many chances to reproduce. You have to make the best of it. So these are insights that Yellowstone is getting. Here's another one. White wolf on the top, her mate 712 below. We collared him. We did not collar her. This is the longest pair bond known in North America. Now there might be longer ones, but you know nature doesn't often reveal her soft underbelly to us. So there could be longer ones, but this was nine years. Average wolf life's about five or six years. They were together nine years. They lived past 10. Remarkable pairing, had over 20 offspring make it to a year old. And sadly, she's the only wolf shot inside Yellowstone, poached near the boundary, someone from outside the park shot her inside, unsolved case still to this day, but remarkable contribution. This is the Valley of Yellowstone, these close insights into wolf life that previously no one's been able to do or few people have been able to do. So what about the elk? This was what had to be done to the elk in the days when there were no predators. No cougars and wolves primarily, and so the population had to be controlled by humans. Wolves and cougars are back, the natural regulators of these herbivore populations. So our cougars, upper left, they restored themselves. Now we have the full complex of carnivores, black bear, lower left, grizzly bear, upper right. They were never eliminated because of a personality administrator like them but they were much reduced, now they've increased. Now you have the full suite of predators back in Yellowstone. The richest carnivore community, arguably in its entire history. Because remember, as I said, 1872, predator control was still was ongoing and it was park policy. So this is what the elk population did. From 1923 to 1968, the park in the state of Montana controlled elk. So they hovered around a few thousand. Here, 1968, that program stopped. Without carnivores, the population grew to very high numbers, probably an overpopulation. And since, because of wolf recovery, natural dispersal of cougars in, bear numbers growing, the population has declined to probably a more ecologically relevant level. This is what nature designed it to be. This is what it looks like when there's no carnivores. Very hard thing to explain because Americans are always about more is better than less, but this is probably the way the system evolved. But this decline is not all due to wolves, but multi-causal because the state of Montana through this time was managing for fewer elk. They thought this was too many. And so what did this do? And we haven't studied everything, but this, you can see this vegetation, uh, how it's come back, Look at how tall it is. This exact area, when I walked through it in 1995, all of those bushes were at knee height. Beaver pond came back. Beavers have come back to utilize this vegetation. So have songbirds. This bird on the right, willow flycatcher. This bird on the left, Wilson's warblers. 
use willow almost exclusively. This is a yellow throat and uses willow and other things. But these birds have been documented coming back since this willow has restored due to less browsing by elk, which is partly due to predation from wolves. And wolves have even helped the bears that were here. This is a wolf kill that the biggest bear has got. The wolf's a spectator. And bears use kills like this in the fall when other food sources are, are low or non-existent. And the one I'm talking about mostly are white bark pine nuts, which is a pine tree that grows a very large size cone with big nuts. And the bears really focus on those nuts in the fall but they're not available every fall because the trees are trying to throw off the insects. So some falls are not around. When they're not around, bears do this. So the uh, wolves have really impacted the ecosystem at many levels and they've impacted people at many levels too. $35 million of economic activity has been found through a study at the University of Montana to be generated by people coming to Yellowstone just to see wolves. This is an aerial shot. I'm locating the wolves one day. The wolves are off camera over here, but look at the number of people. Yellowstone is the best place in the world to view free ranging wolves, and it's a worldwide sensation. And this is something I overlooked. I was thinking pure ecology, pure nature restoration. Wolf recovery has been great value to people. I mean, the world is comprised of shopping centers and plazas. This is real nature. People crave this real closeness to nature. Look at that. Happens in the winter as well. What would that be like running across a wolf howling in front of you on snowmobiles? It also to people means hunting. And so a lot of folks who some of them don't like wolves, it's felt that social tolerance of wolves will increase if they can be hunted. If they can even be curtailed from areas where they really don't belong because the age old conflicts that I talked about at the beginning of my talk with wolves. Again, this is not a creature that lives well in civilization. And so hunting is part of the mix. Killing wolves because they prey on livestock is part of the mix. This equals social tolerance. However, we're not all the way there yet. A photo like this is deeply disturbing, showing that human attitudes still have a ways to go. And that's why I wanted to speak for a second time at the WCN Expo to communicate this because this needs to become part of our fabric, not my scientific inquiry, but about your discussions. And so here's the full sequence. This is the slide I showed you at the beginning. I'm circling this pack. This wolf is bedded. She jumps up and starts on the attack. I didn't even see these elk. What are they doing? But the elk were running from the wolves. They didn't want to run through the trees. I would slow them down. But there was a cliff here. And this focus or made the wolves funnel through this area between the trees and the cliff, which means some elk fell out here in the back. Boom. They grab one. This is the pack. Literally bear hug this elk calf. They're all on it. But elk calves are a big target because wolves focus on vulnerabilities not the healthy ones, but the vulnerable ones. And youth is a vulnerability, as we all know. Here's the photo I showed you before. Again, we need to confront this up front. And they kill it. The pack continues. The elk doesn't. But there's big ecological meaning in this event. And we need to take it full on. So here's where we are today. Wolves have come back to the, the region that I work in. The Mexican wolf, there's some wolves in Oregon and Washington, not persistently studying California yet, and the upper Midwest. And that may be all we can do because they need space. They need a lack of people. They need hundreds of square miles upon which to roam. There are discussions of other, area, other areas, but that's where we are now. So to finish, I wanna come back to some of our friends. And by the way, this quote, I've spent my life trying to put a number on something. And it hasn't worked. So here's a couple stories. This is the daughter of 925, 926, who was in 926 when she was pregnant and her mate was killed, captured on a remote camera in Yellowstone. 
So she's moving on into the wilds of Yellowstone. Who could not love that face? That inquisitive look of wildness, of a creature out there beyond our control. Who could not love that? And then this is the daughter of the white wolf right here. So she, even though she was poached, she is carried on. And this is her offspring, the next generation. So this is what I'm talking about. This is what national parks mean, the protection. So what does wolf recover to Yellowstone? Why is this bigger than Yellowstone? Well, one, we've taken advantage of this worldwide recognition. Yellowstone's a big deal. We've been able to capture the positiveness of having wolves back. Secondly, long-term research. 80% of wildlife research is three to five years. That handles very well the basic questions. But to get to a deeper understanding of nature, to have her give up all her secrets to us, and keep in mind too, not every year is the same. In fact, each decade seems to be different. Long-term research is key to understanding nature. And this highlights that you can take on controversial subjects. In the United States, in a polarized culture, where we can help restore nature. That's very important for Yellowstone wolves going beyond the park. And so why should we care? Because the future is going to be coexistence. It's going to be sharing the planet with our other creatures as the human population grows, as more pressure uh, is put on national parks. What I didn't say here, we have a book coming out in a couple of weeks, early November. Uh, this took us six years to write summarizes our 25 years worth of work. Importantly, the last time I came to the WCN Expo, I met at the cocktail hour, Jane Goodall, and asked her to write the forward to the book. So WCN has a very uh, important function to do with this book and that Jane Goodall wrote the forward and when I met her in San Francisco a few years ago. And so here's my last slide. This is a photograph from the frontispiece of the first monograph ever written on wolves, uh, The Wolves of Mount McKinley, 1944 by Adolf Murray. Maybe Adolf knew back then to reach people, you had to go to the heart and not the mind. So he's quoting the poet of the North, Robert Service. The mountains are a part of me, I am fellow to the trees. Look at those eyes, that is wild nature. That is what we almost eliminated. That is what we need to preserve. Yellowstone helped do that. Thank you very much.